Welcome to the Center for the Economics of the Internet here at the Hudson Institute. My name is Harold Furch, Scott Roth, and I'll be your host today. Seventy-three years ago, armed forces of the Allies poured into Normandy uh, to begin the liberation of Western Europe from Nazi Germany. Today, we're going to speak about a different type of liberation, liberation of spectrum from uh, overregulation. Uh, and it is our great pleasure to have with us today uh, Tom Hazlett, professor of economics at, the, at Clemson University. Uh, and Professor Hazlett is, uh, in my view, the uh, world's leading authority on spectrum economics. He's just published a book, Political Spectrum, <laughs> uh, available on Amazon and at leading bookstores everywhere. Today he's going to talk about Political Spectrum, the next chapter, kind of a forward-looking view. We're very pleased to have Professor Hazlett here with us today, uh, and uh, we're all looking forward to your talk, Tom. Uh, well, thank you very much, Harold, and uh, it, it is a pleasure to be here, and particularly with you, because uh, I've certainly learned a lot from uh, Dr. Furchgott Roth, Commissioner Furchgott Roth, over the years, and you've been a, a, a clear-headed voice and a, a very alert uh, practitioner of the art of public policy, and so it's, uh, it's terrific. Um, I, before you get started, I forgot to mention, after your talk, everyone is invited to purchase a copy of the book directly <laughs> here. We have, uh, we have books for sale as well. <laughs> and with that, Tom. Great. Um, so I think I have uh, PowerPoint slides. Are we on? This is a beautiful facility. It's just amazing. Terrific. You got it right here? Great. So uh, I do want to talk about the next chapter, but uh, uh, since I've been working on the book since I was five, uh, I thought I'd talk about some of the chapters that are in the book, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get through that. And here's a picture of the, of the book, and this is what you see on Amazon. I want you to look very carefully at the screen right now. The internet people taught me that. Uh, so uh, this, this thing of uh, wireless, and we, we are here on a historic day, and uh, uh, it, it is good to stop and think what happened uh, 73 years ago. Um, a little before that, uh, we had uh, um, a remarkable thing happen in science. It started really as kind of a magic trick. and. People have been uh, a bit befuddled by it for a long time, this idea. There's a quote attributed to Albert Einstein. It turns out that Einstein never said it, but it does get quoted that way very often. And it is that uh, Einstein said that uh, the telegraph is like a long cat. You pull the tail in Los Angeles and it meows in New York. Wireless is the same without the cat. So it's always been this kind of a trick. And in fact, there was a Supreme Court uh, uh, chief justice who said in 1930 that he hoped that the court did not get any radio cases because he didn't want to have to plunge into the law of the occult. Uh, 1939 World's Fair, you had a television exhibit. And in the demonstration of a TV set, they actually went to great lengths to make it glass encased because they wanted to counter the rumor that there were actually little tiny people on a miniature stage running around inside and uh, show everybody it was all electronics. So we have this kind of mysterious thing, and um, it does seem off-putting to a lot of people, but you delve into the history of how this wireless comes into the marketplace. It's interesting technology named after what it's not, wireless. Uh, it, it's, it's really quite fascinating to see how it develops, the relationships between the inventors, the corporations, the consumers, and of course then the regulators, the political spectrum develops. So in 1993, I was uh, actually in um, uh, Prague uh, 
um, uh, the Czech Republic, they just split. And of course, uh, post Iron Curtain, the new reforms had developed such that the first new private television license had been issued uh, in uh, the Czech Republic. And um, I was not in Prague to deal with this at all. I just read about it on the way over, actually. And I mentioned to my host when I arrived, I said, look, I read that there were 27 applications for a TV license, and yet the regulators only gave out one. And uh, they said, yeah, this, is, this has just happened. Would you like to talk to the, to the regulators about it? I hadn't thought about it, but I got this nice uh, opportunity, and the institute that was hosting uh, said, look, we'll send a translator with you. you we have two, two members of the commission. So the next day, I'm sitting there uh, with a translator asking my question. But before I had gone, I had made a prediction. I had told my host, I, I said, you know, I don't know anything about how they made this, uh, you know, rule that they were only going to give out one license. But I'm going to predict that they said for technical reasons they gave out one license. So anyway, I'm, I'm there with the two, uh, two commissioners, the Broadcasting Commission and the uh, the Czech Republic, and I ask my question, it's translated into Czech, and then they start answering. And in the answer, I hear, technica, technica. And yeah, I, you know, being a rude American, I start, you know, chuckling. <laughs> yeah, well, I, come on, my prediction, you know, how many predictions do you make that just come through like that? So they looked at me a little startled because I didn't speak Czech, and all of a sudden I was laughing at their answer. This is, you know, rude and a squared for an American. And uh, anyway, so we, we hammered that out, and uh, I said, look, I, you know, the United States originally allocated Space 41 over the air TV channels. So you go to Rome today, you can get 40 off the air. I haven't done any atmospheric tests, but I thought, you know, if you're like the rest of the planet, maybe you could squeeze a second license in. And so the, the answer I got, after technical reasons, you'll love this, Harold, being at the FCC as you were, they said, well, our engineers are actually at a conference uh, this week in London, so we, we'd have to ask them about that. <laughs> uh, isn't that great? Uh, technical reasons described in a way we didn't understand, but we're going to repeat them at nauseum. And by the way, all of our technical people are off at international conferences. And, um, uh, and, and oh, by the way, uh, even if you only do get one license, and that's not a lot of competition. We don't want to have any more because we want a lot of Czech language programming, and there won't be enough of an economic return if we don't limit entry into the market. So all of a sudden, we were into cross-subsidies. I've been with these people for less than five minutes, and we had, in the international language of the political spectrum, already iterated on things that would sound very familiar to anybody who had spent time at the U.S. Federal Communications Commission. And this was all about creating scarcity while citing scarcity and natural technical reasons, and then using the, the gains from, from that, what economists might call rents, but using the gains to distribute in a way that was politically palatable um, at, at the same time that nobody's really much worried, it seems, about the lack of competition, the lack of innovation that, uh, that comes into the market as a result. And in the United States, we have this history that says that the reason we have a regulatory system uh, that is uh, centralized and administered uh, in a way that uh, can can restrict competition and and create uh, 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 create monopoly power is because of uh, what the United States Navy long ago called etheric bedlam, which has got to be one of my favorite uh, phrases for competition. Uh, the United States Supreme Court later went on to call it a cacophony of competing voices. And yes, they misspelled cacophony in the days before spell check. I guess that was an occupational hazard even at the Supreme Court. So I always like quoting it and uh, noting the, uh, the spelling error. Um, it turns out that that's not exactly what happened. There was not a tragedy of the commons or uh, anarchy in the airwaves. In fact, uh, there's a very nice story about this. Um, uh, Marconi invents radio in about 1895. And uh, I'm throwing papers around randomly here. Thank I you. do that all the time. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, Marconi invents the radio about 1895. Things are fairly quiet. There's not a lot of contentiousness. Not a lot of people have radios. That changes with a business model. 
November 2nd, 1920, a station in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania starts broadcasting, trying to, at a high power, distribute its signal very widely so it can sell radio receivers. Broadcasting is born within two years. There are 500 broadcast stations transmitting all over the United States, and it turns out that this is not anarchy. In fact, there were, uh, there, there were rules. The authority was uh, created in 1912 statute, the Radio Act, comes shortly after the Titanic disaster. And it says that the Department of uh, uh, Commerce, uh, and here's a picture of Herbert Hoover, became Secretary of Commerce, 1921, uh, that the Department of Commerce uh, has the authority to issue rights and to minimize interference. And in fact, the Department of Commerce adopts what are common law rules, priority and use, uh, to say that if there is a broadcaster on a particular frequency in a particular area, that that, that that obtains as a right, and that if somebody wants to come in and share the frequency, they can cut a deal. There were time-sharing arrangements and all kinds of money changed hands. In fact, licenses traded, stations traded for hundreds of thousands of dollars with the rights attached. So radio develops in orderly fashion in the 1920s. Millions of radio sets are, are sold by 1926. Um, they're four million uh, radio households, and they're, they're buying expensive consoles. These are not the cheap uh, radio chips of today. Um, there, there are disputes in the, uh, in the, uh, to, to regulate or constrain the etheric bedlam. There's one famous one I talk about in the, in the book with the colorful uh, evangelical radio minister from Los Angeles, uh, uh, Amy Semple McPherson, who sends a very tart uh, um, a telegram to Secretary Hoover at the Department of Commerce. She had strayed from her wavelength that was broadcasting from the Foursquare uh, Gospel Church in Los Angeles, and um, she uh, she exclaimed that the uh, uh, the uh, minions of Satan were telling her to get back on her frequency, that the Lord had given her her frequency assignment and could not be adjusted. And uh, Hoover shut down the station until she got back on her wavelength and the Lord and Reverend McPherson and Herbert Hoover uh, went on from there. Now, in 1926, Hoover wants a lot more authority. There's a political interest in actually having discretion, not over keeping order on a first-come, uh, first-served basis, which is what, what the rules had done, and Hoover boasted that these had been very successful in maintaining order, but in getting more of uh, political um, oversight to this emerging medium of public opinion. And in fact, the broadcast stations, the uh, very successful early commercial stations, were totally in favor. In fact, they came up with the idea of a public interest standard. 1925, the National Association of Broadcasters suggested uh, to Hoover and to the legislators, let's have a new law. Well, in the summer of 1926, Hoover stops enforcing radio rights. No more first come, first serve backstop. People like Amy Semple McPherson can go where they want. and. Um, uh, what happens is very interestingly, there actually is a case that there is a property right at common law uh, found and enforced by a court. Where else are they going to understand property rights? Cook County, Chicago. And this is a headline from November of 1926 from the Chicago Tribune, the Tribune owned the station, uh, that was actually suing to get a property right to move a station that had encroached on it and moved during this period, which was called the period of the breakdown of the law. And it's the second headline there, slightly shaded, that says that there's a uh, court fixes radio rights in air, WGN wins. Uh, by the way, the top headline, if you go back 100 years in the Chicago newspaper, you're liable to see some local official indicted, and that, that's the headline here. But uh, uh, it's another charming aspect of history. But the, uh, uh, the idea was that there were these first come, first serve rights. Uh, we, we did have an enforcement problem when, the, uh, uh, when Secretary Hoover backed off, didn't enforce, and that did build demand. There was some, some confusion. There was some chaos at that point. And there was a demand, a new demand, renewed demand for legislation. Hoover had been trying to get this since 1921. And sure enough, the Radio Act passes is signed into law February 23, 1927 by President Calvin Coolidge. That's the date. Uh, the Federal Radio Commission is still with us since 1934. It's been called something different, the Federal Communications Commission. The statute is uh, virtually word for word the same. Is passed in 1927. The main thing it does is it does not. It preempts private property rights in the ether. It actually allows regulators to determine in the public interest who has a right to transmit, 
what they say, what technologies they use, the business models they deploy. It gives wide discretion to the regulator and um, uh, preempts rights. To, to, to have a license, you have to uh, actually sign a waiver saying you're going to pr push no vested rights in the ether. Well, that's the, re the, the situation we have today, but it's not the same situation in all particulars as we had in 1927, and it's changed quite a bit. But let me just tell you the, the two stories that I want to give you um, on this. Um, the first is... Um, 1927. Here we are. One of the great inventors of American history, Edwin Armstrong. Uh, he graduates from Columbia University in physics, 1913. The day he graduates, they invite him to be a professor. He says, sure, I'll be a professor, but let me go to graduate school at the same time. <clears throat> and um, uh, so he, uh, he, he's, a, he's, in essence, a prodigy. He's already, as an undergraduate, accumulated uh, patents in radio technology. And um, uh, he, he goes on the faculty. Uh, he goes and works with the uh, U.S. and French forces during World War I to develop radios. Uh, comes back. He's again at Columbia by the early 1920s. He's the largest shareholder in RCA, uh, given the fact that they're buying his intellectual property with stock. Now, uh, by the way, this is a cool picture that is in the book. Uh, the world's first boombox, portable radio, 1923. Uh, if you're a prodigy and you've you know, <laughs> you want to celebrate with your bride, what do you do? You dress up in formal attire and go to the beach and uh, give her the world's first portable radio. So there it is, 1923 on, the, on their honeymoon. So, uh, so you have this great inventor, and uh, he's contributing to AM radio technology, the course is the, ra uh, the, the, the rage in the 1920s. We've talked about KDKA and so forth. That's all AM. Uh, and um, uh, he comes up with a new technology, FM technology, in the 1930s, 33, 34. It gets demonstrated. Radio engineers say it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And he goes to the Federal Communications Commission and says, look, I'd like spectrum for this device. They say, well, let's, let's check with some experts. All the experts we check with says it really won't work. It's not as good as AM. Well, those were the incumbent, <laughs> the, the, uh, the incumbent radio technologists and the, the radio station said that. So it took a while. Uh, by 1940, however, there is an allocation for FM radio. There is an allocation, 42 to 50 megahertz. Here's an old radio, 1941 radio. It's got 42 to 50 megahertz. I don't know if you can see it. That picture's in the book as well. Um, it's got the AM band that we know today, which is about 550 to 1700 kilocycles. And then it's got this 42 to 50 band. So uh, there are about 500,000 radios sold, 40, 41, the end of 41, of course, World War II. Uh, and all civilian electronics production of this nature stops. Armstrong himself goes back into the uh, United States Army, ends up a colonel. He always preferred being called a colonel uh, than he did a professor because he was very patriotic and very much enjoyed his service uh, to U.S. Armed Forces and uh, created radios even for uh, Patton's Third Army that was going so fast it couldn't be uh, hampered by wired communications during World War II. So 1945, the war is over, and there's a petition at the Federal Communications Commission from CBS and NBC. They say, you know, you have to move, you have to move the FM allocation. And the FCC looks at it and says, yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to do that because there are sunspots. Sunspots that will uniquely affect this band and this technology. And Armstrong is apoplectic. He introduces all kinds of uh, expert testimony, including the expert testimony of U.S. federal government experts, not at the Federal Communications Commission, uh, all of which are unanimous in their appraisal that there's no sunspot problem. Of course, if there had been a problem, Armstrong and the FM investors would have been um, uh, they, they would have been um, uh, the first to want to move. There had been 500,000 radios receiving FM radio signals. Again, these are very expensive consoles, and it's only in the Northeast that they got built uh, before the war started. It was a very successful service, rave reviews. It was called High Fidelity, much better than AM. Signals actually traveled, traveled uh, not only with clearer reception, but much far further. And now the government's going to move the entire band over the objections of all the FM champions. Well, that's what happens. The entire band 
is eliminated, a new allocation is made, you know what it is, 88 to 108 FM today, but there's no technology, there's no FM for that, they have to dry, drop a new standard, all the radios are, are worthless, and uh, the system is um, a dead zone, oops, is that what it is? A dead zone. And uh, Armstrong is defeated, just flummoxed, he fights, he, he, he does devise a new standard, new radios, new stations, um, but it's a failure. Meanwhile, he's in court contesting intellectual property disputes. In 1954, he dresses up and walks out of his 11th floor apartment, uh, not using the hallway, using the window, uh, having written a note to his wife. Uh, Twelve years after his suicide, his wife actually wins substantial uh, judgments and settlements from RCA and other companies, and she, she ends up being very wealthy. Um, and ultimately, in the 1960s, FM radio was liberated. Long after Armstrong is gone, it's given a chance to compete. Within a very short number of years, it totally dominates AM and becomes the preeminent over-the-air broadcast medium for, for audio. Okay, this is what a new technology faces under the public interest standard. Now, there's a lot in the book about this, including a whole section called Silence of the Entrance, you know, uh, DeMont Television, uh, uh, low-power FM radios, uh, the prohibition on local news for satellite radio today, must-carry rules, equal time rules, fairness doctrines, and so forth. Um, the LBJ stories are fun. Um, and um, there is criticism. People notice that there are some problems with this public interest system. And one of the critics is an economist uh, who did live to be 102, Ronald Coase. And um, he, uh, he actually thought about this good and hard in the 1950s, and this idea of, not, of, of endemic market failure and, and tragedy of the commons. Why does the government have to centrally plan the system? He thinks maybe if you distributed competing rights to use radio spectrum, that the markets could work things out. He wasn't sure. He wanted proof of concept. He wanted some experiments. But he thought that it was very imperfectly done under the public interest standard, that the incentives and information available to regulation, uh, regulators probably was poor relative to competitive markets and what they might uh, uh, motivate and reveal. Um, so he said, let's, let's try a system of property rights. Let's see if that works as an alternative. He goes to the FCC to testify about this, the first question he gets, um, tell us, Professor Coase, are you spoofing us? Is this all a big joke? Uh, the Rand Corporation, famous think tank, actually commissions a study on the system of private property rights and radio spectrum. They put the uh, paper out for review and kill their own study. They refuse to publish it based upon the fact that it was so controversial. Uh, in 1977, many years later, it's actually mentioned in an FCC proceeding that there might be auctions of wireless rights. That is immediately denounced in an official FCC document by two commissioners that proclaim that the chances that there will ever be auctions for FCC licenses are about equal to the odds on the Easter Bunny in the Preakness. So that was a critique that didn't go so far so fast. There was another critique at the same time, however, that comes out in the most famous speech ever given by a U.S. regulator, May 9th, 1961. And that's it, the vast wasteland. Chairman of the FCC, Newton Minow, tells the executives of the broadcast television business at the National Association of Broadcasters meeting in Las Vegas, he says, when, you're, when television is good, nothing is better. But when television is bad, nothing is worse. And he goes on to condemn uh, the sitcoms, the westerns, all the advertising. It's terrible. It's a vast wasteland. Inside the hallway, stunned silence. Outside the hallway, universal praise. The tough cop is standing up. The sheriff, new sheriff is in town. He's going to stand up to the licensees who are wasting the public's airwaves. The best the broadcast industry could come up with was a little derision of its own when they called the shipwreck 
uh, on a show that debuted three years later on CBS, Gilligan's Island. They called it the USS Minnow. Uh, take that, Chairman Minnow. And in fact, uh, the chairman said that he would be the new sheriff, that the FCC was going to look very carefully at the license renewals and see if the public interest was really being done. And in fact, he was going to go back to Washington from Las Vegas, and there were going to be new forms, tough forms that had to be filled out for renewals. Alas, no new forms. You've heard of no new taxes. No new forms. <laughs> there weren't any forms. Everything went on pretty much as it had gone on before, except this. 1962 was the Carton Mount, uh, Carter Mountain decision at the FCC, where there was a complete 180 pivot. Cable television, wired TV, had been ignored by the FCC. Well, it hadn't been completely ignored. It actually had been a uh, process on it in the late 1950s. It said, we don't have any jurisdiction over cable. There's no reason we should, and let's just leave it alone. But what was happening in the 1960s is that in some markets, cable operators to get around the artificial scarcity of the triopoly, ABC, CBS, NBC, to get around the lack of competition there, despite the fact 81 channels have been allocated to the service for over the air, the market's building capacity, spectrum in a tube, trying to give customers more choice. And the incumbent broadcaster said, no, this is where cable stops. And instead of going back to Washington and coming up with forms that make it tougher for license renewals, the chairman of the FCC went back to Washington and carried the water for the incumbent broadcast industry by quashing, reaching out, and expanding jurisdiction of the agency to regulate something that had not been regulated at the federal level, cable television. And in fact, for about 15 or more years, there were very pointed anti-cable regulations that tried to preserve broadcast TV as an uncontested dominant player in television. It was explicitly done to save the fledgling UHF stations and informational programming important to a democracy. This is when there were 15 minutes of news nightly on each of the major broadcast networks, 15 minutes. And by the way, it wasn't even a competitive 15 minutes. It was all homogeneous. It was all the same voice. In fact, there was no voice. This is uh, the, the great quote from Richard Salon at CBS News, accused of having a certain viewpoint, and he denied that. He said, we are not left-wing news, we are not right-wing news. We are the news from nowhere. The news from nowhere. And uh, so that's what was being protected to protect democracy. Competition was being stifled to make sure that nothing disrupted that equilibrium. So, yeah, no new forms and the news from nowhere. Now, the second most famous thing ever said by an FCC chairman, I assert, is probably the most uh, infamous. In an interview in Reason Magazine in 1981, the Reagan-appointed chairman of the FCC, Mark Fowler, said, television is just another appliance. It's just a toaster with pictures. Now that has been roundly condemned, <laughs> to put it mildly. Google it today, you'll still see uh, whole articles devoted to an attack on this uh, point of view that we should allow market competition, viewed as a sort of a regular phenomenon, to do the, uh, the heavy lifting for the public interest and not have the regulator uh, do this with particular special unique rules. And in fact, if you like I, well, I actually wasn't watching this. In 2012, we're watching um, Jeopardy, you might have seen the category, Mad Men for 800. In the 1980s, growing broadcast empires had help from the mad monk of deregulation, Mark Fowler of this commission. Remember to put your answer in the form of a question. Okay. Now, it just turns out that the deregulation that Fowler was talking about is of a piece with the market-oriented experiment that Ronald Coase was talking about and was just something that actually came into the world 
Some might say the deregulation wave of the, 19, the late 1970s was part of this. Some, like myself, have argued that the move from broadcast to cellular and mobile markets, for various reasons, sort of defuse some of the politics and put a bigger premium on efficiency and move markets to become more liberal, more open, and more competitive. Whatever those reasons are, there's no question that there was a shift in policy. There was a deregulation that allowed cable TV to come in the market. And for example, uh, you see that over 20 years of the new forms regulation, the vast wasteland approach where you're going to have uh, tough regulators, a new, a new cop on the beach, an old cop, uh, a cop on the beach, an, uh, an old sheriff, whatever, you're going to have the regulators do the heavy lifting. We actually eliminated a national network. That's all that happened for the first 20 years of broadcast television. Okay? Uh, the first 20 years of cable TV upon deregulation actually spawned hundreds of new channels, programming channels, from public affairs, which the government said it was protecting, which truly came in the form of C-SPAN and then competing news networks 24-7, to all kinds of variety, diversity, and provocative, cutting-edge material. Uh, everything from um, uh, what we now enjoy on, on, on cable TV and cable TV networks, uh, to over the top, similarly unregulated. Um, we get the same uh, kind of thing even in uh, handsets and consoles, receivers and transmitters. Tremendous progress um, with um, the deregulation, the liberalization of markets. Now, 10 years ago this month, the iPhone was introduced. And the iPhone's just a great juxtaposition to FM radio. What happened with Edwin Howard Armstrong? We've been through that story. What happens with Steve Jobs? Circuit 2005, uh, this magical innovator in uh, Cupertino, California, meeting with his, his peers, and they have an, I, an iPad uh, in their big secret project. The iPad actually was scheduled first. They switched it and said, no, let's do this radio. Let's put this radio out there. And the iPhone, until they leave, it, uh, leave the prototype in a bar uh, in Silicon Valley, becomes the secret project of all time in the tech world. And um, Apple has to figure out a way to get radio spectrum for its radio. That's what it needs. By 2005, they don't go to Washington. Where do they go? Well, they first went to Verizon, the Tiffany network. And they said, we want a special network just for the iPhone. What can you do for us? And they talked, didn't reach a deal. Verizon had a good network, and it was proud of it, and didn't want to make the deal that Apple wanted to make. Sprint finds out about this. Sprint throws itself at Apple, wants to do a mobile virtual network operator that sits right on top of Sprint's physical network. Apple takes one look at that and says, what does AT&T have to offer? <laughs> and at the end of the day, they ended up with a lot from AT&T to become the exclusive licensee in the United States at first for the iPhone. Of course, within three, four years, uh, Verizon's got it, T-Mobile's got it. By 2011, uh, even Sprint has the iPhone. Uh, the iPhone buys Spectrum in the marketplace. How did that happen? Well, license rules had been liberalized such that instead of having very specific authorizations to do particular technology, services, and business models, with cellular in particular, there is a spectrum right that is authorized to carriers. And the carriers are in a competitive environment. That's a huge revolution. In the 1970s, when the United States government first considered cellular, the initial premise was that there could only be one wireless operator per market. And oh, by the way, it couldn't be an independent operator. Only AT&T, a vertically integrated monopolist, could actually run this business. That came to be the radical position in the 1980s that there could be as many as two firms competing in the market, the cellular duopoly. And of course, today we have three, four, five, depending upon market all over the world, and that was a huge radical shift, a disruption in the old uh, public interest monopoly vision. In addition to that liberalization, you got flexibility in the use of radio spectrum. You got network architecture that was now 
ceded to the operator. The government did not prescribe or even keep much track of where the base stations were. The technologies in the United States in particular were particularly liberalized such that the operator could choose GSM, CDMA, the Motorola, Nextel technology, and others, which have cycled in and out over time. 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, new services, texting, mobile data. That is not prescribed in the license. No regulator gets to say yes or no. No regulator considers whether or not a new radio like the iPhone is going to interfere with existing users. Of course it does, massively. The carriers make cost-benefit calculations. How much will it cost? How much business will we lose? How much new investment and capacity will we have to make to accommodate the service? And, oh, by the way, how much do consumers really like this new service? That's the process that takes place 2005-2007. June 29th, it rolls out, and they're standing in line for what becomes the iconic consumer application of the age. That's how that gets to market. Steve Jobs tragically dies in 2011. Not only a billionaire, but a man who has conquered the market that he entered. And a tremendous reason for that is the liberalization and radio spectrum that took place and welcomed the innovation that he offered. So it's the reverse. And it's the reverse. It's a policy. Here I'm talking in Washington about a policy success. Don't judge me. And we have to understand that arc of liberalization, how the public interest system did not start with the best of motives or the best of structural technologies. The regime was put in place by advocates like Hoover and the incumbent radio interests to block competition and to afford more discretion to regulators. They thought that was, certainly they were sincere, they thought that was the best way to proceed, but it was not the way to introduce the most competition or to welcome innovation. And Edwin Howard Armstrong is a martyr to that failure. Steve Jobs, some might call a martyr to a success, and the market welcomed what he had to offer. Now, by the time we get to the 10-year point, 10 years in the history now, 2007, we embark on a new revolution, the smartphone revolution. Certainly there were smartphones around. In fact, they were, you know, the BlackBerry was a wonderful machine. By 2008, we had a president who claimed he, you know, he had been a crackberry victim and had to give it up as president. These were wonderful machines. The prototypes were there, and Apple just did it differently. They created this wonderful ecosystem that comes out of these radio machines, where, again, nothing has to go through the mother may I of permission in Washington. Everything now goes through carriers, through applications. Apple becomes a wireless giant without owning any spectrum assets, without having any wireless licenses. They bury BlackBerry. Now they provoke competition. You know, Steve Jobs' last great campaign was he was, he thought, you know, the idea for the iPhone had been stolen in the Android world, even though Google Android is an operating system, you know, and it applies across scores of different manufacturers' devices. But that is provoked. That competition spurs a reaction. The iPhone innovation brings us Android. And so they both go into the market with tremendously innovative ecosystems, none of which works through Washington, all of which works through the market. And this is the vision of Ronald Coase, tested and approved for use. And so we have come a very long way, such a long way, that as we sit here today, we can say that wireless is dominant. I mean, we live in an advanced industrial society where we still have wireline telephones. But go around the world. There are no telephones on wirelines, okay? We have 6 billion subscribers to wireless in the world today. More people have wireless phones than have toothbrushes. And yet, fixed-line telephony maxed out at about a billion many years ago. 
So this liberalization, which has come to the rest of the world, in some cases even farther than the U.S., in most cases not quite as far, but competition, flexibility in spectrum use, innovation allowed without permission, that's come so very far that now we talk about the mobile data tsunami and how we can get more capacity, more bandwidth into the market and away from where it's been tied up, allocated for military, government uses, over-the-air broadcast television and the TV allocation table of 1952, how we can move that forward. And of course, we've had this debate in the United States for some time, I'd say um, for at least two decades. And uh, the standard uh, reaction of regulators is we can't get that spectrum We've got a hold up. These broadcasters are going to kill us. They're very influential in Congress. And it's like Dr. Evil demanding a gazillion dollars just to move a TV station. Uh, and so, uh, to its credit, in 2009, 2010, the FCC took up this question and they came up with an answer. They said, first of all, that we have these long delays in spectrum allocation, too long, six to 13 years. Six to 13 years was the documented. Uh, uh, in the national uh, broadband plan, the range for this. And it came up with, with something that's too much text to read on a slide, I apologize. But the basic idea was this. We're going to have uh, an auction, and it's going to be two sides. We're first going to, we're first going to um, allow TV stations that have licenses tell us what they'll sell the licenses back to the government for. Now, footnote here. In this room, I imagine a lot of you understand this is a very straightforward way to get cooperation from the, from the licensees. On the street, if you explain that we're buying back licenses that have been issued in the public interest by the government, and we would be prepared to spend $10 billion to buy 145 station licenses, you'll get into a, you know, if they're paying attention, they're gonna, there's going to be a conversation about that. That seems weird. It's the political spectrum. There is no way to actually have the government, even though it's found that the political, the public interest is not to have so much. We started with 81 channels in 1952. We started with 81 over the air. We actually trimmed that down to 67 channels in the late, um, uh, in, in, in the 1980s. We took that away, that allocation. Some of it went to cellular. Then in the 19, um, uh, in the 2000s, we got down to 49 channels. Uh, part of the digital TV transition and a 2008 uh, auction were part of that. N uh, now we're still at 49, but the FCC in 2010 with a national broadband plan uh, put together this two-sided auction to try to make further progress and pay the TV stations to go away, to just give us the spectrum that they're parked on. Okay, so this is paying Dr. Evil his ransom. I'm, I'm not... I don't hate broadcasters, it's just it's a cartoon character, so you understand. But um, that's what the FCC idea is, that we have to, you know, that there's these, these roadblocks out there. And so that, that's, of course, one side of the auction. The other side is how much will companies like T-Mobile, bidding against maybe Sprint or, or Verizon or, or others, how much will those companies pay to use the spectrum in a liberal way for things like mobile data? in new flexible use licenses. And so we had that auction. The FCC calls it an incentive auction. The term incentive is just pure marketing. Uh, pretty good for government marketing, by the way. Uh, but all auctions are incentives. I mean, you, you, know, <laughs> you have an incentive not to pay more than you want or take less than, than, than you can get in an auction, uh, depending upon forward or reverse. Here we have both put together, the reverse auction for the TV stations. How much will the TV stations take to, to leave? How much will new carriers, uh, new licensees pay to get the, uh, uh, the rights? And the idea was to get out of the, the 49 channels, uh, to basically turn 20 ch the TV channels that are existing in the air over the last decade, uh, how many of those channels can we turn around? The FCC wanted to get 20 channels to turn over to mobile. So as we sit here today, the way the auctions played out, there were, um, there was, the FCC was only able to get about 12 channels, 70 megahertz. So instead of 120 megahertz, the FCC got 70. Uh, the forward price for the new licenses, $20 billion plus or minus. The price, uh, the, percent, uh, the, the part of that that's going to go to the TV stations, about $10 billion. No. 
know, this is what the numbers are. So that th this now, this, so this is how the auction played out. Uh, there were four stages. In the first stage, the FCC backed down, backed off the 120 megahertz goal. The megahertz are on the horizontal axis there. So there's 100 megahertz that's on the far side. The FCC originally tried to get this. Sort of looks like a supply curve, by the way. The FCC calls it that. It's not. There's a problem with calling it that. I'll talk about it in a second. But the there was 100 megahertz that uh, to get that much, the FCC thought it had to buy licenses. I don't know the number. It hasn't been released publicly yet. Uh, the FCC uh, found out it was going to cost about $86 billion to pay TV stations to get that 100 megahertz for mobile. And what was bid was all through all four stages here was only about $20, $22 billion. So that wasn't, the, the, the auction had to go to a, a second round, a second stage. And so at that point, just 90 megahertz was sought. The, to get 90 megahertz, the FCC thought it had to buy stations that would cost $56 billion. The prices go down with fewer stations being purchased. Uh, still, that was too much. We went to a third stage. Still, the lines don't cross. Finally, the fourth stage, 70 megahertz is procured at a price of about $20 billion for the licenses. The payment now is just $10 billion. So that last 10 megahertz, going from 80 to 70, saves about $30 billion in the demands of TV stations. Now, the FCC, as I said, thinks this is a supply curve. How much it costs to get? Well, it's a supply curve for something, but it's not a supply curve for radio spectrum because it turns out that the value of the radio spectrum used by broadcasting is very close to zero. Okay, and this, this goes back to a letter that I wrote to uh, Chairman... Uh, Julius Janachowski in the FCC in, 19, in 2009, it was published in the Financial Times as an open letter, where I generously, generously offered to buy the entire TV band and guarantee that there would be broadcasting on all the, all the broadcasts would continue through satellite, and that I, again generously, would give every household in America that did not have cable or satellite reception to already get these signals would give those 10 million households a satellite receiver. And I would continue to deliver their broadcast stations to them with satellite receivers. And I would pay, I would pay the government for this. I would pay in excess of $3 billion for this. Uh, they didn't take me up on it. Okay, but they did take the idea. This is what they're trying to do. Now, the fact is that for about $3 billion, you can give 10, 10 million households satellite receivers and continue just doing the same thing we're doing now, which is we got two national footprints for satellite distributing broadcast television signals in all 210 markets in America. Let's just continue doing that. The marginal cost is essentially zero outside of the $3 billion to give these last 10 million households a satellite dish. So when you talk about $84 billion and $56 billion to free up Spectrum and do all this, you know that the actual social marginal costs are very, very low. Broadcasting, well, I'll just give you one example of how I know they're low. Um, when the auction was closing, and this is from February, TV stations that sold licenses started announcing that they had made such and such amount of money from having their offers accepted. So this is the, Chicago, uh, the Tribune company, uh, 190 million and their other gray television and so forth, um, Sinclair. All the, station, all the station owner groups have issued the same notice. And they all say there's no material change in operations for selling back their TV stations. Now, Tribune got 190 million, some other stations have gotten 300 million plus or minus. Pretty significant money, some public TV stations we're talking about. Pretty significant dollars have gone to the TV stations. They can share with other stations that remain on the air and their operations continue unchanged. There's no loss in audience. In fact, the over the air is the least of their audience. Cable and satellite continue completely unaffected. And that's 90% plus of the market. In fact, 
The market now, as we all know, it's the third generation, not broadcasting, not cable, not satellite, the fourth generation, I should say, over the air, over the top, excuse me, over the top, broadband distribution. So we're very much past the TV allocation of 1952, but we still, even if everything goes smoothly now, and I think things will go fine now, I think we're in the fast part of the auction because we have overlay rights now. We have T-Mobile being the big winner, for example, spending $8 billion out of the $20 billion to win licenses, about 30 megahertz nationwide out of the 70. T-Mobile is, they're going to be paying TV stations to get lost. They're going to be cooperating very actively with the incumbents to make sure that they get off the air. The FCC is giving uh, some of the stations 39 uh, months to move and so forth, uh, three years. It, that transition will go fine, in my opinion, uh, because now we have the right incentives in place. But we're still going to be stuck with 35 over-the-air TV channels that are worth very little in over-the-air broadcasting service. And what to do about it? Well, the way that this should have been done, I said in the 2009, in the filings and comments, the 2009-2010 National Broadband Plan, and which the FCC did consider and did cite and did say this was a good plan B. Now it's plan A. There is no additional incentive auction. The statute that allowed the FCC to do the two-sided auction, that was a 2012 law that said one auction only. The FCC said the broadcasters were only going to do this one time. Sell out now or forever hold your peace. You're going to be locked into a terrible niche market if you don't sell cheaply to us. That was the incentive, part of the incentive auction. So the regulators are committed to only one of those. Now they have to do something else. I think they should do what they should have done for the whole TV band to start with or some years ago, and that is to issue new overlay rights. The overlays allow the TV stations that are currently in the market, the incumbents, to do everything they're doing now. There's no change to the incumbents. There's no coercing them to move channel assignments or anything else. Just stay where you are. But there's a new license, and you can issue several per market to make it competitive. You should do that. You should do it by auction. And then the new licensees have the right to use all the unoccupied channels instantly and to have a secondary right to the used channels, the TV channels, to negotiate with the TV incumbents to vacate or do something else or to, to move to channel share, whatever it is, to reallocate the radio spectrum. The overlay right downloads all this negotiation to the marketplace. Yes, you're going to have transaction costs, you're going to have some holdups, but you don't have to wait 10 years to try to figure out how to do this through a centralized, two-sided, administered auction in Washington. And you really don't have an alternative at this point for the last 35 channels that are on the air. 210 great megahertz. We've got broadcast satellite. We've got cable. We've got over the top. Let's go ahead and see what the market can do. You're not forcing anybody to move. You're not uprooting broadcasters. You're just giving the broadcasters an extra option, and that is to deal or to buy the overlay. Okay? So that's what the plan is. That, I hope, will be the next chapter. Um, uh, and um, one of the things that comes up is unlicensed. What do you do about unlicensed if you just have these new licenses? Well, there is absolutely no conflict be between having more spectrum used the way unlicensed bands are used on a plug-and-play environment where there is no network. There are uh, household or enterprise-created networks locally but plug-and-play equipment distributed across uh, the marketplace, there's no, there's no conflict. You, certainly, I, the advocates of unlicensed should have the opportunity to buy more spectrum and to set aside their own spectrum parks for this. Getting more spectrum in the marketplace would help in that. There is a general... I don't see where I'm at on this. Yeah, this is just catching up. Um, there is a general idea that the government should go ahead and allocate more spectrum to unlicensed because it's done so well with Wi-Fi, which we do talk about the very important liberalization, 85, 89, at the Federal Communications Commission to allow new and interesting technologies, uh, spread spectrum in particular, to use those bands. But the, um, the fact is that just taking, setting aside new spectrum, even on a shared basis, or particularly on a shared basis, sometimes is very, very difficult without responsible economic agents that can actually go to Wall Street 
finance a transition and pay people to cooperate. And what I mean by that is this, TV white spaces, uh, Wi-Fi on steroids. Okay, this comes in in 2002 with an FCC edict that Wi-Fi has worked great, let's have more of it. Um, it turns out that the TV band uh, has been allocated for white space use. Uh, this is now 15 years and running in terms of the rules being developed. Uh, Non-exclusivity, of course, is the, the mainstay here. It doesn't mean that there are no property rights or there are no rules. Of course, there are lots of rules. And in fact, that's the problem, that the, 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 the regulators have to run this, these kinds of um, devices, uh, you know, the spectrum of state property. And what they've done in the TV ban is what always happens when the government tries to sponsor the sharing arrangement, and that is that they want to protect incumbents. Okay? You can read any of the, the white space proceedings, TV white space proceedings, over the last 15 years, and they start with the protection of TV broadcasts, at which point I say game over. The point of the TV broadcast is to figure out ways to transition those broadcasts, to be more efficient, to get to consumers in a way that reflects the cost of the technology and the benefits of the technology today. Not to blindly protect the TV allocation table of 1952. That's what the white spaces do, and they burdened the unlicensed devices that have were, were reported to be Wi-Fi on steroids, had the best press you can possibly uh, have. And when I was writing the book, I had to go and the, the good thing about the Wi-Fi, uh, excuse me, the uh, uh, wireless devices, the white space devices, is that they're, they have to register in a database, and I can count the number of them. So we can see how they're doing. And how are they doing? Well, in May of 2016, there were 597 white space devices in America. Okay, that's, that's not thousands, that's not millions. You're not, we're not leaving off zeros. That's the number of white space devices. That's, that's what was Wi-Fi on steroids. And that comes from protecting the TV stations and then you know, burdening the, the new technology with rules that have to share the space according to a regulatory template. So that, that has not worked so well. There's a compu confusion now of, you know, if you like Wi-Fi, then you want to have more Wi-Fi allocations. That's completely wrong. I love video. That doesn't mean I want to have more broadcast television allocation. Okay? It's not the efficient way for me to get uh, wireless video. Okay? There are much more efficient ways. I want the end of Mother May I in Washington. I want competing markets and responsible spectrum parties holders and users uh, to, um, to get on the market and do this. And, and the, the analogy of public parks, which is interestingly often used to justify more unlicensed allocation, um, is, is given. That, that's a great, it's, a, it's a great analogy, the public park analogy. Here's a public park, Central Park. There's private property to land. Okay, you can have an allocation for resources that are commonly shared, even you can call it a commons if you like, even though the state, the city of, of New York, in fact, owns this property, but um, it acquires the property in the market. The market continues to function and reveal the opportunity costs and the relative values of using the resource in one allocation or one deployment versus another. And those competitive forces are really important for information and incentives of the whole system. So, yeah, there should be more unlicensed and licensed spectrum, but the unlicensed should not be by fiat. It should be by market. And when it is by fiat, you get things like, you get things like this. Oops, did I have the, uh, yeah, the light square debacle, where you have, you have a nationwide, this is 2012, you have the, the, the collapse of a nationwide build-out for a, a, a new 4G, LTE network, state-of-the-art advanced uh, mobile telephony, and because there's nobody to negotiate with when there's an interference dispute with the next-door neighbor, and there's no owner to the GPS band that was complaining about out-of-band emissions, it was actually the other way, they were, they were looking into the, uh, this L band that was used by Light Squared, there was no way to cut a deal, and the whole thing just collapsed because the regulators bowing to political pressure quite... Uh, 
you know, in, not, not surprisingly. So we don't want planes to crash, and we have to believe the Department of Defense, the FAA, and, and Garmin. Anyway, um, there, there are ways uh, around this, and establishing more responsible parties, as Coase suggested 50-plus uh, years ago, would be a way to do that. So this is my favorite graphic in the book. Uh, who doesn't belong and why? An inventor, a regulator, and an innovator. Okay, so I'll leave it to you to figure out which one, which one I'm saying doesn't belong. But that's it, and thank you. <laughs> yeah. We have time for a few questions, and uh, when you uh, ask a question, please identify yourself. We have people all over the world watching on the Internet and the like. Uh, how about the gentleman in the back there? Yeah. Um, first, thank you for an exceptionally uh, well-written book on this subject. It's hard to find such skilled writers on this subject. Um, in your book, you quote Larry Lessig uh, five times. Uh, Larry ran a center at Harvard, uh, the Center for Ethics. And one of the major themes that, by the way, I was a fellow there at that center for two years, is academics who don't disclose um, conflicts of interest. Much of the center is on the medical field, which is a rampant problem. He believes it's a big problem. Academics don't believe it's a problem. So in the field that you've chosen, uh, many of the academics have major um, conflicts of interest or interests. And um, uh, I was wondering what you think about that, because you cite many of them without mentioning their conflicts. But also yourself and your co-authors have had many industry connections, and I have, maybe because of the publications you tend to write in, the law reviews, they don't really require disclosure. Do you think it's a problem <clears throat> that there isn't disclosure. Uh, most people believe it's <laughs> ir irrelevant to their work. First of all, but could, it, could it, you please it, identify yourself? Oh, uh, Jim Snyder. My name is Jim <laughs> Snyder. I've written much on yeah. politics, a spectrum over the years, and I often disagree <clears throat> with Tom. And though he's written a beautiful book describing the problem, uh, uh, that's a different issue. But the question is, should you be disclosing and your colleagues these types of financial, there are very few academics that earn as much as people that work in the spectrum area, even though it's a niche area. Should it be disclosed? Larry obviously believes it's a very important thing. Um, does, does Larry disclose? He does. Yeah, I think he's very good at doing it. And there's some academics like Peter I'll, Grant, who I'll, I'll let you uh, yeah, respond and then we'll move on. Right. No, it's a, it's, it's a great question, and I'm very much uh, in favor of, uh, you know, full information about what is happening with conflicts of interest. And I, uh, I, I do pay attention to uh, the rules that are now being taken seriously, for example, by the American Economics Association. There are general conflict rules in disclosing uh, how academic papers are written and then submitted to academic journals. You say that law reviews maybe are, are, are being left behind. I certainly, if I work on something, I, you know, I would disclose uh, and, and do disclose. And in many forms, I will, you know, not be involved because I, I'm working on something that is not appropriate to disclose. So, uh, it, it's a it's a big problem. It, it, be honest, it, it's not covered well. Even the implication of your question is that there is a disclosure and there's a non-disclosure. There are all kinds of conflicts that are never disclosed uh, in terms of where people are, are funded within universities and within nonprofit organizations and so forth. So it really is, it, it deserves attention. It's gotten some attention. There is some literature on this. As I say, the economists are trying to um, have rules that the members of the American Economic Association can adhere to and have some um, Im important, um, uh, you know, disclosure. I'll, I'll say also just uh, briefly. It's obviously a very big problem in the medical field, and so you, you, you know, if you want to look to uh, where the conflicts really uh, are very problematic and where there is some progress being made in terms of disclosure, that's one of the places to go where people could have better rules. I think. So I appreciate that. 
Next question. Uh, here. Uh, Professor Hazel, Dr. Furchgar, uh, thank you very much for this time. My question is about uh, use of uh, spectrum for public safety. Um, FirstNet and the opportunities as sort of spectrum and, and spectrum usage evolves, how do we or what, who has the responsibility to make sure that things like police, fire, EMS are able to use RF in the most efficient, effective, meaningful manner? Right. Well, FirstNet is this uh, public safety network that's been many years in the, in the, in the making and is still not here, but there's, there's, there are things happening now, so there's some hope. Uh, the, the, let's say the good part about FirstNet is that it's a mixed-use network. It's not totally quarantined just for public safety. That means that you're going to have mass market consumers paying to build a network. You don't quarantine fire police and starve the service and give them old technology and um, and, and and you know the the idea that the police uh, have four thousand dollar handsets that don't work as well as a flip phone in terms of their capability and their network functionality that's where we've been for a long time so we're trying to get uh, a, 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 a better system uh, ideally we talk I think a little bit in the book about the fact that the um, public safety all government organizations really should be buying services they don't make very good integrated network providers of the service I mean they don't have we don't tell the police station here's some uh, steel and, and rubber and plastic now go make the car they buy their police cars they have requests for proposals and they they buy uh, from from specialized suppliers they should be buying from specialized networks and and have backup capability and redundancy and you know multiple uh, services uh, multiple networks in the mix that's the best way to do it now FirstNet is a step in the right direction, but it's still very much an allocation for public safety. And it's getting spectrum that has been bottled up for, certainly since before the 2008 auction, there's specifically 10, 10 megahertz in there that was unsold in 2008. Uh, so it goes back a long ways, and you can see the delays in, in this kind of top-down structure. So I have some sympathy with the fact that there are 50,000 public safety organizations in America and you get a lot of balkanization just because of the, de the decentralization of the market. So some of those coordination problems are, are real. There are no simple solutions. But one very basic principle is that we should be forcing these services into a competitive marketplace where the suppliers who specialize and compete with superior services and radios and handsets and network functionality can provide state-of-the-art, uh, you know, interconnected services for public safety. So, uh, yeah. Last question. Uh, gentleman here. Well, uh, this Gerald Prothero Estropi. So this all started with Marconi in a sense, so it's an invention. Uh, what do you see as the uh, importance of supporting innovation? What should be done in, in that uh, regard? Or, or not done, just generally your thoughts on innovation in, in the sense of incre increasing spectral efficiency. Right. So, you know, I, I certainly do talk about it in the book, and I focus in the book, as you, you're not shocked, that, the, you know, the spectrum allocation system, if you do have a roadblock at the end of that pathway to research and development and deployment, you're going to have less innovation. There's going to be less commercial purpose to push forward the science. And so you do notice that when the roadblocks are lifted, uh, particularly for digital mobile networks in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, and liberalization allowed creativity to come in the market and new, new networks to form, you were able to get pretty amazing new stuff. And, you know, one of the, the great things about the wireless is that in the United States we did not uh, mandate a standard. And so we got an entirely new uh, format, uh, technical standard uh, that Qualcomm has, has pioneered, uh, a U.S. You know, technology supplier. In some sense, it came out of defense uh, research, but it was able to get to market. Now, the Europeans and many countries around the world blocked that because they had a homegrown uh, technology they wanted to, for industrial policy purposes, they wanted to favor. And they were successful in the 2G, the second generation wireless mobile handsets, they were very successful in getting economies of scale for GSM. Uh, for better or for worse, the world was saved in 3G and 4G by the fact that there was competition. 
And there, there were other places to go for some of the problems that developed in that home brew from Europe. And um, of course, the, the devices we have now are a mix of technologies. So there has, has been you know, forward progress and standardization and diversity and competition all at once. That's, that's a pretty nice story. And a lot of it has to do with this liberalization and spectrum. So I would think that the more we can do that, the more bandwidth we move into the market, the better it will be. In terms of funding basic research, there, there are certainly challenges there. When Bell Labs goes away, there has to be, you know, there have to be competing centers. There are, uh, but uh, those, those are challenges that I'm, I, I don't you know, specifically assign to the, the radio spectrum allocation problem. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Books are for sale over here on the side.